This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh, as we continue with our guest. From Paul Ryan to what's happening around the country and the conservative movement and those that are challenging it. Nermeen? Well, in Oklahoma, dozens of teachers have completed a seven-day, 110-mile march from Tulsa to the state capital, Oklahoma City, where they will now meet with lawmakers to demand they pass legislation to fund education in Oklahoma. Public schools across Tulsa and Oklahoma City remain closed as thousands of teachers continue their strike into its ninth day. Our guest, Corey Robin, recently wrote on Facebook, in West Virginia, Oklahoma, Kentucky and Arizona, we're seeing the real resistance, the most profound and deepest attack on the basic assumptions of the contemporary governing order. These are the rule midterms to be—these are the real midterms to be watching, the places where all the rules and expectations we've come to live under not just since Trump's election, but since forever, are being completely scrambled and overturned. Um, <clears throat> Professor Corey Robin, can you talk more about these teacher rebellions? I mean, you had the stoppage in Kentucky, you had West Virginia, and they won. Uh, you have now— um, you have now uh, Oklahoma and then Arizona. We're talking about Trump land here. I think it's really important uh, for a couple of reasons. Beyond the specific issues of teacher pay and the classrooms and the quality of public education, which is in such a parlous state, um, what these teachers are really uh, doing is raising the question about the low taxes, low public services uh, politics that we have been living with in this country for a very long time. Um, I just want to bring us back to, for a historical analogy, if we went back to 1978, and this is why the midterm question is important, um, if you had looked at the midterm elections in 1978, you would have seen that the Democrats were still firmly in control of the House of Representatives and the House and the Senate <laughs> and in, in control of many state legislatures across the country, you would have had very little inkling, just looking at the midterms, of the very profound right-wing counter-revolution that was coming in two years in the, the election 1980. If, however, you had looked at what happened in California with Proposition 13, which was a which was a public ballot initiative that basically made it very difficult uh, to raise taxes anymore. There you would have seen the future of American politics for the next half century. Likewise today, I think if you're looking at what's happening in Oklahoma, really, as you said, in the heart of Trump country, these teachers are saying, um, are saying something that is such a challenge to the Republican Party about taxes and spending, but also to the Democratic Party. I think it's very important. Democrats have been terrified of being tagged as the tax and spend party, really, since Walter Mondale. And what are these? And the only times Democrats are willing to raise taxes is to deal with the deficit or the debt. What are these teachers are saying? They're saying raise the capital gains tax, not to cut the debt or the deficit, not to be good government people, but instead to deliver vital public and so services that the public needs and wants. And I think that's the real challenge I mean, that they're posing. I mean, this is such an astounding story that's happening in Oklahoma. You have schools that are only operating four days a week because they don't have enough money for the fifth day, and the teachers don't have enough money to teach for the fifth day because they need second and third jobs. We had a teacher who was taught, what, for 20 years, and so had her husband. And her husband, on his day off, he sells his own blood products. <sighs> It's, I mean, it's horrible. But in a way, it's just a very extreme version, I think, of what happens in a lot of states. I mean, I teach at the City University of New York. It used to be one of the crown jewels of the city and of the state. It has also been systematically been underfunded and defunded by both Republicans and Democrats alike. This is a national problem. What's so amazing is that it's being confronted in the place where you would think there would be the most support for it. And not only are they doing You're talking this, about Governor Cuomo, Democratic governor. Yeah. Yes, Cuomo Democratic here in New York. And going way back to his father as well, uh, defunded CUNY. Um, but Mario Cuomo. But in Oklahoma, you know, these teachers are, are doing this, and, 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 and they've got it's amazing to me is, is that they've got overwhelming public support with what they're doing. Well, has there been any precedent? Is there any precedent for this number of, of teacher strikes or even pl public sector workers in general in the U.S.? I think there, oh, there definitely has. I mean, public sector workers have really been in the forefront for the last right. 50 years of, of leading strikes in the 1970s, particularly women and people of color were in, in the vanguard of a lot of these efforts in organizing public sector workers. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons you could say that the Republican right has been so pushing so hard on 
this Janus decision, which would basically make it very hard for public sector unions, the Supreme Court decision, is precisely because they feel like that's the last bastion of unionized workers, uh, and they are workers that tend to be, rest, compared to the rest of the workforce, uh, overwhelmingly and women and people of color. And this is why judges are so important right now. And as you have Mitch McConnell saying, the fight should be in the Senate. We're going to lose the House, he yes. said, apparently, this weekend, according to The Washington Post, that the fight is around the judiciary, and they are packing these courts. Yeah. I mean, they do take this extremely seriously for anyone who thinks that uh, President Trump isn't getting anything accomplished. I mean, this has been very clear from the early part of the Trump administration. They were bung they bungled so many other things. Uh, but the one thing that, from the get-go, they knew how to do was to get the courts, uh, the, the judges appointed. In fact, he's been appointing judges at a faster rate than Barack Obama did, I think faster than George W. Bush did. Um, but that tells you something, though, I think, not not about the strength of the conservative movement and the Republican Party, but about its weakness. McConnell is very clear about this. If we can just hold on to the Senate, we can have a lock on the courts, not just the Supreme Court, but the courts, for 30 to 40 years. And remember, the judges they appoint, these are people who are, you know, in their 50s and their 40s, who will be with us for a very, very long time. I mean, you have this uh, ju judicial nominee, Vitter, Wendy yes. Vitter, um, who worked for the Arch Archdiocese in Louisiana who, when confronted by Senator Blumenthal yesterday about whether she supports this landmark Supreme Court decision, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, challenging desegregation, she demurred. She said she wouldn't say. Yes. Well, this is, their, this is the big strategy. All the conservative justices and nominees have been pioneering, really going back to Judge Bork uh, in the 1980s, which is say nothing, uh, make no statements whatsoever about your points of view, and you can present yourself as if you're—you know, remember Clarence Thomas said he had no opinion whatsoever on Roe v. Wade. He had never—he claimed he had never even had a conversation about Roe v. Wade, even though he was in law school when Roe v. Wade was decided. Uh, so this is a long-standing strategy to say nothing about what your opinions are and get you, get you in that way. And you have Stephen Reinhart now, who has just died, a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, a huge deal, um, was the last of President President Jimmy, Jimmy Carter's uh, federal judicial appointees, Trump can now remake the Ninth Circuit. Yeah, I mean, and this is and this is really the goal. I mean, it's it's been really astonishing again, given the dysfunction and the disorganization that we've seen throughout uh, this administration, their inability to pursue things on so many fronts. Uh, but when it comes to this, uh, this is something that they've been very focused on, you know, almost maniacally so. Well, can you talk about, Corey, uh, the rise of someone like Bernie Sanders and all the movements, um, the Occupy Wall Street movement, Black Lives Matter, in the context of what you were saying earlier, that these strikes are, are geared towards mm -hmm. not just Republicans, are opposed not just to Republican policies, but also Democrat policies? Yeah. So, you know, the Repu as I've said, the conservative party, uh, the conservative movement and the Republican Party is quite weak, I think. And in part, the reason why it's so weak is because conservatism, you know, as a historical project, really was overwhelmingly successful. The fundamental target of conservatism, number one, was the labor movement, and compared to what the heyday of American labor completely succeeded in destroying it. And the second target was the black freedom struggle, and they were very successful in, de in destroying that struggle as well. So the conservatism, I think we have to realize, has been very successful. Um, and what you're seeing now, I think, on the left, uh, in, in both Occupy, Bernie Sanders, the teacher strikes, Black Lives Matters, is a growing confrontation within the left, a growing reckoning of how successful, in fact, conservatism has been and how feckless and ineffective the Democratic Party and traditional liberalism has been in opposing this. And I think Frankly, the real story in American politics right now is not so much what's happening with the Republican Party and the conservative movement, which, as I've said, is by any historical measure uh, quite weak and incoherent, precisely because it was so victorious over the last several decades. I think the real story, the real question is, is there going to be a force on the left, not just movements in the street, but an organized force that's able to tip this house of cards over? So, talk about that further. Um, what exactly you mean? Where you feel the Democratic Party is failing right now? 
Well, I mean, first of all, you could just look at the numbers. I mean, Bernie Sanders pointed this out in Mississippi the other day and got actually attacked for it. But the fact of the matter is, over the last 10 years, the Democrats have lost nearly a thousand legislative seats. That's, the, I think, the highest proportion of seats lost uh, under a Democratic, a two-term Democratic president since at least maybe Dwight David Eisenhower. I mean, it's you, you oftentimes lose seats, but the proportions were just tremendous. And the Democratic Party as a whole um, is really a kind of gutted machine. I mean, the, the mere fact. I might say that Bernie Sanders was able to get as far as he did in those primaries tells you how weak and sort of uh, structuralist and rudderless the Democratic Party is. Um, but I think the real question is on the left: Do you have an, an ideology, a theory, a kind of set of accounts similar, frankly, to what Ronald Reagan did in 1980 or FDR did in 1932? These are these two great realignment presidents. Great, not in the sense that I support. Uh, Reagan, but, you know, powerful. Um, and what they did was articulate a really profound, completely countervailing set of ideas and institutions, and were able to shatter the existing dispensation. I think that's the question that we're, that's on the table and that Bernie is sort of slowly pushing towards. Well, Corey Robin, we thank you for uh, this very interesting discussion, one we will continue. Professor of Political Science at Brooklyn College and Graduate Center of City University of New York, author of The Reactionary Mind, Conservatism from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump. A very happy birthday to uh, a landmark birthday to Anna Osbeck. Democracy Now! produced by Mike Burkner Feltz. I'm Amy Goodman with Nerman.